I'm very pleased and extremely excited to introduce our speaker today, Simon Moores. Uh, rather than go through his extensive and very impressive bio, I'd like to make three points about uh, Simon. As followers of the Energy Seminar may remember, the last pre-COVID live uh, seminar we did in NVIDIA Auditorium was by Vivis Kumar, who's actually a principal in Simon's operation called Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. And uh, he gave a uh, talk on lithium ion uh, battery supply chain issues that was uh, very um, uh, well received by the audience. It was great excitement. I remember sitting around with, uh, with Vivas and uh, some of his, he was in the Stanford MBA program at that, at that point, with some of his MBA colleagues and other Silicon Valley titans. And we asked the group who else would be good to talk about in this area. And, to a person, there were probably a dozen people there. They said, Simon Morris is your guy. You ought to go after him. And we did. Uh, but it was difficult because we were then in COVID lockdown. So we had to work out a way that we could have him speak, uh, but not travel here and uh, not be up in the middle of the night. So that's number one. Number two is, uh, if I told you I had predicted a lithium ion uh, or that the 2020s would be the decade of lithium, uh, in 2018, you would have not been very impressed, but as far as I can figure and re reading up, Simon predicted this about 2006. So we all stand to learn many lessons about technological forecasting and the interface of that um, uh, with, with business. And the last distinctive thing uh, about his talk today is it is the first time we've done a asynchronous one. We have two or three people uh, primarily in Europe that are uh, on inconvenient time uh, frames, and uh, Simon was the top of our list. But if this works out well, we may try a few more. So, with that uh, further ado, I'd like to, to uh, turn it over to Simon to explain this magic that he has to foresee the future and execute a business plan even before that future arrives. Simon, take it away. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you very much, John, and uh, I appreciate you and Sarah inviting me to speak here after Vivas's talk. Um, and I'll be speaking about a similar, well, the same subject, but maybe a different angle, building this lithium ion economy. And I would love to think uh, that back in 2006, when my career started, I, I predicted where we would be today. I didn't. I mean, I joined a publishing company uh, that covered minerals, metals, mining, commodities as a whole, uh, and I was given lithium. And I liked it because it was different. It was using technology. Uh, it wasn't using uh, what most of these minerals and metals are used in, which is like steel, big industrial markets, it was actually tech markets. And a year later, the iPhone came out. And then about a year and a half after that, the Nissan Leaf came out, the first full, um, let's say, commercial electric vehicle, pure EV that was on the road. So that's kind of how it started. And then, you know, ended up in Benchmark in 2014, creating this company and collecting data. But I'm going to share some slides of data to outline really uh, what we do at Benchmark and, and how we see this this lithium ion economy. So this is how we just kind of describe it. It was, um, it was how Vivas uh, uh, explained to the uh, last year on our Washington DC event, Vivas called this a platform technology. Uh, and he's absolutely right, which is why I've had so many comparisons to semiconductors. Um, so I'm gonna look at everything to do with this supply chain. So this is the supply chain as we see it. And um, as you can see, there's three main components, the, or four main components. You've got mining, everything comes from the ground, you either grow it or you mine it. Uh, something as simple as that is actually, uh, can be quite stark when you actually think about every, all these different types of products we use, but everything comes back to minerals and metals and the fundamentals of digging it out of the ground. These are the key ones, the, the, the critical uh, mineral inputs, the critical elements that go into batteries. That's why we selected these. You could have copper in there as well. You could have aluminium, uh, but the, the critical ones that are going from the niche to the mainstream and take quite a lot of speciality, uh, a lot of skill to process. That's why we collect data on these for now. Um, first, you dig it out the ground mining, then you go into chemical processing, making these into battery grade materials. The next step is cathodes and anodes. Then you're making a battery cell and you're putting, you're putting it into a car. Now, um, the, the key thing we do is we collect data on every single part of the supply chain. The midstream of the supply chain is absolutely 
it's difficult, it's crucial. Uh, most of these companies are private companies. So we have created a system where we know these companies have collected data on a monthly and quarterly basis, and it's all commercial supply chain data. So really tracking what's actually happening, what's actually being built. The last point about this slide is the bit at the top, which I think from a culture perspective of companies is fundamental. You've got three main cultures that are clashing and not quite agreeing. Uh, mining is one, a very unique culture that is set on decade, decade long time zones and, and, and longer than that. Chemical processing in the middle, I'd include cathode and anodes in that as chemicals guys. Now that is a very specific, also semi long term industry speciality, not a commodity. You've got battery manufacturing and car making, which really does fall into the, the assembling the manufacturing side of things. Um, of course, you can say batteries are speciality manufacturing, but it's important to know it's still manufacturing, you're not chemical processing. And these three cultures of these different um, parts of the supply chain have to align in order to build out uh, this, this lithium ion battery and electric vehicle supply chain for this energy storage revolution. Just one slide on benchmark what we do, because you can follow us on social media. LinkedIn and Twitter, we put a lot of information out on, but we sell subscriptions, data products, and analysis, what we call actionable intelligence for people that are either actively in this supply chain, like our lithium price assessments, which are used to settle contracts, uh, or other bits of data, like we track every lithium ion battery plant in the world that's active now, and that's also being built, including the chemistries behind it, the capacities, capacity utilization, so on and so forth. Then we also do an, uh, an analysis on the news as well. So it's like tiers of, of information, but we put it out there in lots of different forms. So you can uh, go on our website, view our articles, and you'll slowly be entered into the, the benchmark world. So the three main things I want to address over the next about 20 minutes or so now would be, it's number one, the... Uh, what I call the trend and the goal, from what is a global battery arms race through to building a lithium ion economy. And I, this, this building a lithium ion economy is, well, I'll talk about it in context of the USA, but the, the, the European Union is starting from, all, all Western economies are starting from scratch here. China really in earnest started about five years ago from scratch building the supply chain. The key thing here, and this is what I was saying to the Senate last year in the US, uh, was when was the last time the US built a heavy industry from scratch? And you have to go back really to, you will know more than me because a lot of you I imagine would be American on this, this webinar, but this is back in FDR days. This is before our lifetimes. So that's a challenge ahead. And the question remains, how much does government get involved in order to help build this, this base, this blueprint? The challenge, as I mentioned, is not just building it, it's building it on time. And the future, you know, is, are there any blockers such as the raw material side, pure chemistry, pure geology? Are there any uh, obvious blockers to make this not happen? Um, so that will be addressed near the end as well. So, I wanted to look at the story of the lithium ion battery through lithium for the first three slides. Now, really, it started coming on the radar, as I mentioned, not just because this was, a, this was my, one of my first articles when I just started my career in 2007, analyzing where lithium is coming from and where it's going. Uh, I call it between a rock and a salt lake, the two main sources of lithium. I quite like that. Um, I quite like that headline. But 2007, when it was on the radar, lithium was just going through a price spike. Uh, the price doubled over a period of about two years from three and a half thousand dollars a ton to about five, just over five to five and a half. And that was because it was finding new uses in power tools. It wasn't before the electric cars, it was mainly power tools, mainly laptops. And then you had the iPhone bump a few years later. So this is the first layer of demand from lithium ion batteries. The second layer of demand came in 20. 14, yeah, there we are, 2014, when uh, this started to happen. Elon Musk and JB and the team, the small team at Tesla decided to build the Gigafactory because they couldn't get their 
tier one lithium ion batteries from their suppliers uh, in, in volume and on time, uh, they decided to build their own battery plant and test a Gigafactory one. And that was the first supersized battery plant that was planned around the world. I'll explore where we are in a bit on that. There's a lot more now. And that was layer two of demand from electric vehicles. So it took a good seven, eight years for this second layer of demand to start coming through. And this is the third layer of demand now. It's the commercialization of that second layer of the EV, the electric vehicle, um, let's say revolution, phase two of its growth. Um, that's the way I describe it. So on the left, 2009, one of the first articles I was quoted in, but I love the title here, lithium car batteries may shift the balance of industrial power. Um, Leo Lewis, who's now at the Financial Times, it's a brilliant article. The headline's even better. Now we are in this, what the Wall Street Journal called in February, uh, the battery is ready to power the world. We're in this, this new phase of growth and, and actually scaling of the opportunity, not just establishing the beginnings of it. And this is what it looked like through the lens of lithium carbonates price. And this is what I want to start. You can always see what the story is through the, the, the price data. And this is what we collect in benchmark for all the raw materials for batteries. The price curves show you the story. And you had this price surge one, which peaked around April 2009. And then we were established, benchmark was established in 2014 to collect this, this, these prices and this data in, in far more detail and a more specialist nature. Price surge two uh, was 2015 to 2018. It really topped out in October, um, late, yeah, it would be late October 2017, but it took a while to come down. And we're just beginning the third price surge for lithium carbonate, uh, well, for all lithium products, which began really in November. And um, the question is, where will this, uh, where will this lead? Will it be higher than last time? The demand is bigger, more customers are buying lithium. There's more of a scramble for a lack of supply that hasn't really built out much since the last, um, since the last surge. There's many things to talk about on that. But the, I want to put these blue dashed lines onto the screen. Now, for me, the blue dashed line was where the, 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 the lithium commercial price for lithium carbonate settled. So before the first wave of battery demand, if you like, in that, in that I mentioned in 2007, before the laptops and the, the power tools were, were sucking up new lithium, uh, it was around the $3,000 a ton mark, the natural settling point for lithium carbonate. After that price surge, price surge one, it started to settle around the $5,000 a ton mark. Interestingly, there wasn't much settling time this time around, as you can see from that chart. Uh, and that's volatility because of the demand we can, we're talking about, but that, that settling mark, the bottom of that, that lithium carbonate price was around the $8,000 and $7,500 a ton mark. Where will it go next? I mean, the rationale behind this is quite simple. You need a higher lithium price, a higher incentive price to bring on more supply because not all of it is going to come on stream as the lowest cost sources in the world, which back then was the Salar de Atacama in Chile. So a wide variety of sources, wide variety of extraction and processing uh, prices to get new supply into the market. So it's really interesting to see where we go next on this. And a, a, the central story for me is what, you know, it's a trend we call the global battery arms race. That's a, a race around the world, specifically between China, the EU and the US to build as much lithium ion battery capacity as they can to gain dominance in electric vehicles. So that's what you mean by this global battery arms race. It's very much a continental thing. It is continents and regions are, are racing to build this capacity. Next will be the supply chain uh, in order to get dominance in this new, this new industry. Because those that can produce these electric vehicles quick enough, at high enough quality, will take the market. Um, you're starting to see that with companies like Tesla, with what's happening within China, but 
the big boys are just starting to enter the, the legacy OEM makers are starting to enter this market and begin to understand the importance of lithium ion batteries and that captive supply and owning that part of the supply chain. So battery mega factories, for us, it's multi gigawatt hour facilities. We track every single one of these in the world and we assess the quality and the validity of them as well. Three years ago, there was three of them. Foxconn was planning to build a battery plant then. They didn't, in the end, they invested in CATL. Foxconn, will, most of you will know, make the Apple iPhones. So there's a connection there. But uh, three back then, you now have 200 in the pipeline at 3.4 terawatt, terawatt hours of total capacity by 2030. So last year, $65 billion was committed to these projects, of which about $45 billion was low capitals in China. And not much really was in the US, single digits, uh, billions. In terms of capacity, not, not just individual plants, but you know, how does this capacity build out of battery cells change over time? And this is how we view it at present. So as you can see, by the end of this year, we will begin next year, is the best way to think about it. We will begin next year with 755 gigawatt hours globally of battery capacity, nearly all of which is destined for EVs. That's about 14 million EVs worth. The average we use is 55 kilowatt hours per, per battery, per EV. That's, e, that's globally, it's just a good average. We know there's a huge range and in, in, especially in the US, the cars are getting bigger, but uh, it's a good range, a good, good rule of thumb average. And then that's going to 3.4 terawatt hours, which is about 63 million vehicles. Now, if you think about how many vehicles are gonna be needed for, for net zero aside, actually, just to replace even some of the fleet, not all of the fleet that's existing, to for new consumers that want to buy new vehicles uh, per year, if there's 80 to 100 million vehicles that are sold a year, we're nowhere near uh, that number here at present. Then you've got energy storage systems that use the same batteries. That's emerging, an emerging industry that's quite starved of tier one battery cells at present. Um, even Elon said, Back in January, they're delaying the Roadster and they're delaying the Tesla Semi because they haven't got enough batteries. They are cell constrained. Uh, so that's, it's a thing that it's not just, as you can see, total battery supply. It's having the right quality of batteries as well. Those tier one battery cells, if you're someone like Tesla or someone like General Motors, for example. Then viewing it through the lens of raw materials. This is a important slide linking the the batteries to um, the raw material inputs. So this is our a 30 gigawatt hour average. So these are averages that we've, we've done an average waiting over the next 10 years. Uh, we haven't got manganese on here, which would be higher than cobalt. Uh, but, but, but smaller than nickel. So a manganese, a good manganese average here would probably be about 8,000 to 10,000 uh, tons on this, on this slide. But what it shows is a 30 gigawatt hour NCA facility, sorry, NCM facility. The Gigafactory is an NCA facility. We understand that. It's just a good image to use to show people that one of these battery facilities, if it's 30 gigawatt hours, consumes this amount of raw material. Now in lithium terms, that's the whole mine's worth. But graphite, that's a graphite anode. That's not flake graphite or, um, what, you know, what, if it's flake graphite coming from a mine, that would be times that by um, two. So uh, it's a lot of raw material. Lots of new mines have to be built effectively for one of these facilities. So a lot of mining, uh, a lot of investment and the scale of this is, is an issue for the upstream at present. Now, this is important because this shows the speed of what's happened. For a traditionally conservative mining and chemicals industry, in 2015, demand for lithium, it was 32, it was all lithium produced in the world, 32% lithium chemicals, it says 32% was consumed in batteries. Only five years later, 
five or five, yeah, five full years later, 67% of uh, all lithium consumed, uh, produced was consumed in lithium ion batteries. It's almost exactly a, a 180 degree flip. The market's gone from 170,000 tons to nearly 400,000 tons this year, is what we forecast. And so it is a complete 180. And what that means is lithium ion batteries and electric vehicles dictate the lithium industry. It's the same for cobalt because their niche industry is going to mainstream. It's not the same for nickel. Uh, it's not the same for graphite. It's not the same for manganese because there are much bigger industries where only a small uh, select portion of that goes into, into batteries. So the mindset is very different in lithium and that's why lithium and cobalt, but lithium especially is the proxy for this uh, EV revolution. So there's a picture of uh, Andy Miller. I thought I'd put some, some pictures of <laughs> mining in there. This, is, this isn't a salad at Atacana and that is lit, that's a lithium liquor that he's, he's touching. But uh, this is a, going in a bit more into building this, this phase two, building a complete lithium ion supply chain on time. So back to the, just to remind you of how we viewed the supply chain, how I explained that at the start. It's uh, trying to link all these things together. So firstly, goal one is to build capacity. You need the volume in the market to meet the demand. The problem is it's demand that's never happened before. Uh, so you can imagine the, on the, the corporate level decisions <laughs> and discussions that are happening when Someone, someone in the business asks for billions and billions, probably tens of billions of dollars to build, to build capacity for something that hasn't happened before. That's been the challenge over the last five years. They're starting to get to grips with it, but it's still a big risk. So lots of companies, the majority of the automotive space are stuck in the headlights with this. But capacity is key. Capacity is building, you know, is having that supply chain ready on time. Quality is the next big challenge. Now, quality allows the, each of these links in the supply chain to connect. So you can't use all lithium in a lithium ion battery. You can't use all lithium ion batteries in all electric vehicles. It's those tiers of quality that cause bottlenecks throughout the whole supply chain. And just explaining uh, this simple principle is actually something that a lot of people and a lot of companies don't quite get. They don't get yet until they subscribe to our data and, and we can explain layer by layer, link by link, what the story is. But as you can see, dig lithium out of the ground, not all of that will be able to go to make battery grade quality hydroxide carbonate. Then not all of uh, producers that make hydroxide and carbonate will, will go into the cathodes and so on into the battery cells. So it's understanding where those bottlenecks are. But the key goal here is volume and quality, capacity and quality, that is uh, the blockers at the moment. This explains the point I made earlier, you can't use all lithium ion batteries in an EV. And this is a really important point, especially for battery cells at the moment, because I feel the EV story, certainly in North America, is turning into a lithium ion battery story. You've seen lithium ion batteries become geopolitical at the top of the White House agenda, both mentioned in an executive order in the American Jobs Plan. Uh, also, the White House stepping in with a dispute between uh, LG Chem and SK Innovation, a dispute on, uh, on American soil. So very geopolitical. And uh, as a result, it's, it's, it's the US needs to actually attract all of these tier one and the future tier one producers into this, uh, into this zone, into the domestic US. Uh, just hammering home the, uh, the other point, the next point is there's no geological shortage of these raw materials, any of them. Uh, the problem actually is investment. This is a, we, uh, our example of lithium demand versus unfinanced, some finance and some recycling supply in there over the long term. But you can see there's a big gap and it takes five, five to seven years to build a lithium mine. If you had a lithium mine and a chemical plant, if you had all the money in the world didn't have to worry about the, the, the raising of the, the cash. You could probably do it in four years, but that money is not there, not in the, the, the quantity, not in the um, long-term nature it's needed for these companies. And that's because a lot of these companies 
uh, well, a lot of the industry is even reliant on the incumbent producers that are generally public companies that can only make three year long decisions or it's uh, junior mining companies, or let's say, yeah, junior mining exploration stage companies that are on stock markets also, that have to get, you know, go to the public markets to get the cash. And it's just an inefficient way for what is a long-term fundamental brick in this, this whole uh, thematic. And this is why really that it's, it's hard for co existing corporates to expand quickly in the existing industry. So back in 2009, if you're a raw material buyer at a battery plant, like that Gigafactory slide I showed earlier, if in 2009, although the Gigafactory didn't exist then, but if you're at a battery plant in 2009, you'll probably be buying lithium at about 800 tons a year. That would be what you have to buy for the next year. It's pretty predictable, growing 5% a year, done. Then in 2014, when that next layer of demand started to come in, you're probably buying at about two to 3,000 tons a year. In, and you, you're expecting some volatility, but it's still relatively predictable. In 2017, you've got three to 5,000 tons a year for your needs. And you might have to double that in the next three or four years, but in increments. So you'll be looking at adding 10% 15% more, maybe 20% maximum to your, to your purchasing over, over the course of time, which is within the pressure points of these companies, both in finance and, and risk appetite and everything else. That's pretty strong, that's pretty predictable. The problem now is if you're, a, if you're buying raw material now for the next three to five years, it's in the 30 to 50,000 uh, tons a year quantities. So actually it's, it's the, the, the growth spurt, the big growth uh, period that we're gonna experience next is the first big one for EVs. The next one is post 2026, 27, and then, then we'll be into the 2030s where it'll be a different world. So unless your mindset changes over this, the course of these years, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the guys that were, were buying raw materials there back in 2009, even 2014, and not in the industry anymore. <laughs> you know, it's been a big culture shift uh, to, to uh, handle these, these quantities, which are literally that are an order of magnitude shift. That term is used a lot in different industries, but for batteries, it is very much an order of magnitude shift. And then nickel sulfate. If you look at uh, nickel sulfate as an example, because nickel and lithium are the most talked about raw materials, I wanted to give you the same idea from the nickel numbers perspective. So there we go. So in 2021 this year, we expect nickel sulfate demand to be, uh, sorry, this is the amount produced. This is 276,000 tons, sorry, 276,000 tons of demand this year. The vast majority is lithium ion batteries. There's a surplus of 58,000 tons. So how do you go to your bosses and say, I want, $3 billion or even a billion dollars to expand new supply or invest in a new mine. If this year is going to be short, but then you say to them, well, no, and what's his benchmarks forecast, but in many forecasts, we're going to be 1.1 million tons short come 2030. It's a problem because you have to be a really true believer. If you're going to invest in even half of that capacity for an industry that doesn't exist. Nickel's moving. I don't necessarily see too much of a, a long-term problem with nickel capacity, but the short term, the next five years is absolutely crucial because I'd say nickel is the furthest behind of all of these battery raw materials. It's also why uh, another reason why you have OEMs looking at this in a big way. So I, Tesla talk about nickel a lot. It's why they're building a nickel chemical refinery uh, in Austin at the Terra factory along with lithium. So it's something to watch. And another point I put there is in CATL, which is the biggest battery producer in the world based in China, their annual demand will be as big as the industry is next year for one consumer. So you can see the, the, the shift that we're going through here. Now, another really key point is the, as the battery cell cost goes down to $110 a kilowatt hour, which is our number, 
for large contract automotive last year. It's a good average. Um, even though there's many price, different prices for battery raw materials, the portion of the raw material pie becomes much bigger. Back in 2014, 15, when the lithium ion battery price was averaging $280 a kilowatt hour, the portion of the pie of raw materials was about 40 to 50%. Now, that portion of the pie is 70 to 80%. And as that cost comes down, uh, you, you, it becomes more of a, the raw material cost becomes a bigger portion. The, the guys making batteries and even the guys buying batteries have to become masters of these key input raw materials, both in terms of it's either owning supply or it's owning it in a contract that's watertight and it's fixing the price as well. How do you fix the price or eliminate volatility of these key inputs to ensure your battery price is as stable as possible for the foreseeable future? This is what our data is used for, um, and that's what we exist as an independent business as well. But it's really important that when the price comes down, the raw materials aren't coming down at the same rate. In fact, at the time, the raw materials are going up. If you look at what's happening at present, we talk about the lithium-ion battery price coming down, lithium price is going up, nickel price is going up, cobalt price is going up. But five years ago, but over the last five years, actually, when, when this battery price trend has been dropping, lithium price is rock bottom, well, rock bottom for this period, nickel price was rock bottom, and cobalt was the same. But now you're going to a, a rising raw material price environment that the battery makers and EV makers have never been in before. How they, how they react as well will be really interesting. Do they own the assets? Are there long-term contracts? In fact, we are seeing long-term contracts. Uh, you see Glencore is a, the world's, one of the world's biggest cobalt producers. They're actually publishing and signing lots of long-term contracts, one of which is 10 years long. And Glencore, 18 months ago, was a business that didn't do any long-term contracts. They mined it, they sold it. Whatever the market price was, we're happy with that. They allowed them to control, get a better price for it, like the traders, the traditional traders they are. Now it's a completely different business model at Glencore as a result. Of, um, of where we're heading. Okay, the final few slides is, you know, why lithium ion battery is here to stay. So this is a price drop that I mentioned. Um, it, you know, if you, you can take a straight line average of the last five, six years of lithium ion batteries and say that is a strong performance. And it is 14.9% uh, compound average price decline of these battery cells since 2014. But if you break it up into two, and 2017 is important because 2017 was the start, the first year of these gigafactories that were coming on stream, the scale that I mentioned um, earlier. Before that, really the, the first two, three gigafactories are up and running, but the test of the gigafactory wasn't until 2016, for example. But you started having scale in the battery industry where 21.6%, 21%. Uh, average price decline was that period where scale started to really impact the, the manufacturing um, improvements, the scale started to really help push that price down. But since 2017, 2020, that, that decline is more than halved, three times, th three X slower than it was. And that's because you've kind of gained those easier wins of scale and raw material prices are a bigger portion of the lithium ion cost pie. I'm not saying it's going to flatline or go up necessarily, but that's a risk you're facing as you go close to $100 a kilowatt hour. It means you've got to be more creative on the way you extract lithium, on how you make nickel, on the pricing of how you lock these in contracts, and that's really key. This is our battery forecast. I'll just put it in here just so you can see how we see this growth from a lithium ion battery perspective. You know, right now we're on that red dot in 2021, right in the middle. But you can just look from the size of the bars. It's, it's, it's silly. We're going from a, a 400 or 300 uh, gigawatt hour industry, give or take, to a 2,500 gigawatt hour industry. Um, it's, it literally is a different world that we're heading into. Final few slides. For me, this is one of the most important slides that I've uh, presented here in the past. It's one that I 
present to the Senate a number of times and keep driving home. You don't have, have to necessarily mine all the raw materials in the USA if you want dominance. In fact, the whole goal here is building this lithium-ion economy. It's building the midstream at scale in order to have dominance. So what this, this uh, chart shows is China's percentage share of production in 2020 of all these um, key parts of the battery supply chain. Whilst China, people might think China mines all these raw materials uh, domestically, it's not true. They only extracted 23% of the world's battery raw materials, but they refined domestically 80%. As a result, 76% of cathodes and anodes are made in China. As a result, this year, 75% give or take of lithium ion batteries will be made in China. But of course, China won't be exporting lithium ion batteries. China will be exporting vehicles. China will probably be exporting American uh, Tesla vehicles. And so you can see the midstream building that capacity ensures those raw materials flow into, uh, into your country, into where these hubs of demand are. Now, for the long term, you've got to, the US and Europe will want to build their own base of raw material supply domestically. We, we say that should be 25% should be your target. Um, and then 75% should be coming from the, you know, the most economic and the most available sources around the world. And that's a good long-term goal, I think, for any governments that are looking to have a plan on this. Final slide, or final but one slide. This is just a takeaway um, to see where all the zeros are in every step of the supply chain in a bit more detail. Of course, the US, we know that US doesn't do much mining, let alone the critical mineral mining, but it's every stage that is a bit bereft. Apart from battery cells, which we, we think will be a first step forward for the US, the US has four of the six tier one lithium ion battery makers domestically. That's a strong position to actually start building huge capacity onto, but that is something the US has to do not just build the batteries, start building big cathode capacity, big anode capacity, then the whole, uh, the whole economy will start building. Of course, battery cells, um, sorry, battery cell recycling is becoming a, a, a thing. It's becoming an industry with some pioneers in there that have big plans. You need that, but you need that also for the midstream. And this is you know, where the, the red circle is where the lack of investment is. And the green circle is where the last five years has seen big investment. Final slide here, it's, it's a story from last week. Battery metals are hot, but these miners can't get investors. Really good story from the Wall Street Journal. And it's, it kind of sums it up. People understand, five years ago, people understood electric vehicles were coming. Three years ago, we had the biggest surge in the battery mega factory capacity investments. Although there a lot in China, the most in China, definitely in Europe and some in the US, batteries were the story three years ago. The next three years, chemicals and raw materials will have to be the story. It has to be the focus, otherwise it all falls apart. And I think that will be the trend of the next three years. Otherwise, uh, the EV revolution will be significantly delayed. Uh, on that, I'll pass it back to John. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Simon. As expected, that was just terrific. Uh, covering you know, corporate strategy, national strategy, national security, environmental impacts and whatnot. Uh, even though we had a relatively small uh, real-time audience, I thank them for putting forward uh, an excellent set of questions. So I'll try to uh, consolidate uh, them. Um, and a lot of interest in, in all, different, all the different dimensions. It is interesting. I could see you would be a great, uh, probably done this World Economic Forum speaker because of your depth and breadth across public and private sector, big co companies, small companies, um, international relations and, and whatnot. So um, the first couple of questions are, are kind of on the, uh, I'm kind of an old school, um, probably amateur at this point, uh, strategy guy. So there's kind of the Michael Porter structural view, the, the uh, resource theory of the firm and the my colleague uh, here at Stanford, Kathy Eisenhart, uh, developed the simple rules um, thing. I see in your approach to this and the companies you describe a, a little bit of a blend of all three. Uh, first of all, do you agree with that, that there's a little bit of looking at the structure of the industry, a little bit of 
uh, do we have the strategic assets and a little bit on let's not um, spend too much time you know, building like someone like I would do a big model and actually uh, take some shots and see what happens and learn from that. I think there needs to be a strategic, a baseline of strategic capacity uh, across every part of the supply chain. And a big part of that is but the two, from, from a sort of top-down perspective, you like the, the, the most important things, one is having the skills long-term to make, to extract and make these materials at quality to make the end product and not outsourcing that around the world, having that condensed into the country, the continent. And the second thing is to actually have the capacity there to make these products. At present, the skills or the know-how tends to sit in universities, but it's not it's not then enacted into, into a large scale commercial operations. And I, I think that's just not, a, not necessarily a, just a challenge for the US, it's the same for Europe and, and you need money for that. You need money to make sure these investments and assets are, are there. And the, and the key thing here is you're building everything from scratch. Nothing really exists at scale at the moment. So it's kind of at what point do you start and when, and um, which is why we always focus on that midstream, the cathodes, anodes, battery cells, and then the inputs will come. Great, great. Uh, now, so a little bit a lot in, in that regard on kind of market segmentation and competitor analysis. So just to get an idea of how broad you look at things and in what depth, uh, two related questions. Um, are you um, doing similar kinds of things for the stationary uh, battery market? And in that regard, is vanadium likely to be more hot going forward than lithium? Secondly, not directly related, but kind of a market segmentation thing. Uh, I've been impressed by, as soon as we were convinced uh, you immediately, people like me somewhat more grudgingly that EVs were a big new thing. Uh, people said, well, uh, what about that hydrogen stuff? When I was a defense department analyst uh, 40 years ago, uh, we were gonna have a hydrogen economy and we're still in our third or fourth round. But I have to say, looking at that field, it does seem much more likely there'll be some uh, hydrogen in our energy economy as we move forward. So. How do, are you tracking those two dimensions of the panoply of things you're looking at? And uh, do you think these are big threats? Are these things that you are already positioning yourself to take advantage of as a, somewhat of an expansion of your current line of business? Yeah, so we track these uh, our hydrogen and other competing battery technologies as a thematic, not yet as a, a intensive data collection process, internally and the two things i'd say on on energy storage uh one they use the same battery lithium-ion batteries fundamentally they can they come from the same battery plants so when we track every single battery plant in the world we also track how much of that capacity is is being committed or let's say sold into ess how much is being sold into ev and the reality is at the moment hardly any into ess because the prices and the contracts, the better prices, the long-term contracts are going into EV. And there's a shortage of those tier ones, which uh, is going to be a problem for energy storage over the next five years. I do think after the next five years, once these battery cells are scaled, then ESS will have its day um, because you're going to get some good deals on lower cost, excess capacity of these plants. Um, but uh, so ESS is, that, that's on one thing. And then with vanadium on the energy storage market. But AM, you know, in theory, is a better battery to use for this market. But for me, if you're a buyer of battery capacity in an energy storage, energy storage unit, you want your balancing costs and availability. Now, with vanadium, it's still very niche. Vanadium being produced for uh, vanadium flow batteries, it's still a very niche industry. Whereas with lithium ion batteries, you've got scale, you've got availability of supply eventually. And that's another reason why people are turning to lithium ion in the energy storage system. But I do think that market and that field is a lot more open. So definitely longer term, Vanadium will have its a role there. But you need someone to commercialize it. You need someone to build the gigafactory for Vanadium. And then you'll start having these kind of movements. And for hydrogen, uh, I think it will be a big part in 
the low carbon economy, I don't think it will compete with lithium ion electric vehicles, but I think hydrogen used uh, to make steel, for example, is really interesting. Hydrogen used in long, long term transport like trains and, um, uh, and long haul trucks, I think it's also interesting. So hydrogen will have its day, but it is a long way behind lithium ion in the commercialization and scaling process at present. So uh, a specific um, kind of strategy, um, market positioning, market power uh, question, uh, one uh, uh, attendee put forward is, what is your opinion of the, I think it's fairly recent, um, uh, proposed now I think actual merger between Oricabre and Galaxy, I guess these are two big, uh, I had to look it up, Australian uh, companies. Uh, what do you view, uh, what's going on there and how uh, do you think it affects the overall market dynamics and what you will do uh, differently, if anything, uh, in reaction to that? Yeah, Galaxy Resources and Oracopra, it's really interesting because five years ago, they were just starting production. So when I changed that lithium price chart way back in 2009, they were the juniors, they were the developers that that you know were struggling to raise money back then when I when I knew them at the start. Then during that second price spike, they raised the money enough to get into production. Now, what's happened over the last the next five years, they've established themselves as two really quite separate producers. One is a spodumene producer, a hard rock spodumene lithium concentrate producer. Uh, sorry, a spodumene concentrate is so a hard rock lithium source in Australia that gets sold to China, and China does the refining of that and value adds. Whereas in uh, Orocobri, they mine from the brine fields in Argentina and make lithium carbonate into a chemical. And that's going into the Asia Pacific market, also imported in China, but as a, as a chemical. And so it made sense both of them coming together because one, you have scale, two, you have two different types of sources, three, you have a, a globe, much bigger global reach, and you have the pricing power with that comes with the scale. And so I think that's those three things are what's going to change the market. Will it change it? It will be interesting to see how others react because Oracobra and Galaxy are getting together to compete directly with Albemarle, American company, directly with the two biggest Chinese lithium producers, Gangfeng and Tianqi. So it's a, I think it's a good move for lithium because you, at the top, you can't have seven or eight big guys. You really need, two, you need three or four maximum to push this forward. Great. And now, uh, fortunately for me, I was going to preempt and ask my own question, but the last question we got was the one I wanted to ask most, uh, because it's really a hot topic here in California for a number of reasons, radi ranging from uh, helping with the low greenhouse gas transition to environmental justice and whatnot. And uh, that is, uh, what is your opinion and assessment of uh, the use of the salt brine lithium extraction project in an Imperial County and the so-called Salton Sea, which I believe is mostly um, geothermal resource development where they found allegedly substantial uh, quantities of lithium. Yeah, yeah, new sources of lithium uh, outside of the traditional uh, sources I mentioned with Galaxy and Orocobre, uh, new ways to extract it. They call it a DLE in the lithium industry, direct, direct lithium extraction, absolutely needed. Uh, as I mentioned, that the, the, the price chart that I showed earlier, in order to simply get more lithium into the market at all price points, doesn't have to be the lowest in the world because you just the price is going to be so much higher. You just need uh, as much opportunity to get lithium out of lots of different sources that we've had before in the past. And that's why in California and Salton Sea, a uh, perfect example of this new 21st century lithium. Now, the key thing here is, it's not necessarily just the deposit, right? It's actually the technology and the know-how and the, the, the brain power that's going into extract um, lithium using this new processing techniques. And for me, that's, that's crucial uh, for this next phase of demand growth. Otherwise, long-term, you're, you're not gonna have that lithium there at the end of this decade when you need it. And so you need as much money flowing towards those projects, as much brain power as possible uh, to solve this problem because the energy storage revolution relies on it. So one last uh, geopolitical strategy uh, 
question. Uh, sorry to load them on, but I find them fascinating. Uh, one questioner uh, points out that Sinovac uh, lithium deposits are uh, probably the biggest in Europe. And you probably know what the question is. Can Volkswagen uh, afford to lose uh, access to that supply source to Tesla? Well, the <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, you know, if you're VW, if you're VW or any of the big OEMs, it, the question is, I guess, how would you secure that supply? Now, at present, that they've only really addressed VW certainly publicly has only really addressed lithium-ion battery supply. So VW want to build four gigafactories in Europe. They announced that on their power day. Tesla, six months earlier, announced they want to build a Terra factory, plus they want to build cathode capacity, plus they want to build lithium and nickel refining on site. So Tesla taking a big, even bigger step upstream, uh, which means there'll be a direct buyer of these raw materials, whereas VW won't be yet, uh, because VW just making want to make batteries. There will be competition for all the de all deposits, uh, certainly the near term large deposits, the ones that are two years away from production, there will be a scramble very soon for these assets. As I mentioned in that Wall Street Journal article at the end, Google that article, everyone will be reading that, you realize that they'll realize once they have these battery plants and these OEMs become battery makers, all of a sudden there's a big gap on raw materials and lithium's the same. So um, yeah, I think that's, that sets the tone and the trend nicely for the upstream. Uh, one uh, general, actually, got a lot of late uh, coming, excellent questions, which we can forward to you. But one last question that came in early that I think might be on viewers' minds now and later in the day is, uh, you haven't talked a lot about the environmental impacts of all the mining across the different materials that you're tracking. Do you think that is a major factor? And uh, one thing I've observed is if you wanted to say, um, criticize the EV movement, you can always pick the worst maintained uh, regulated mine in the world and come up with a pretty good story. But how do you, how do you think about that from a strategic level? Uh, obviously, if the public gets uh, concerned or governments get concerned about these broader sustainability issues through the mining uh, part of the industry, how, where do you think the big um, challenges are from your point of view in that regard? I do think it's always a bit unfair on the EV industry, this supply chain that's been built from scratch. That the, you know, if you're building it now, you're going to be placing the most stringent, uh, the most stringent rules, regulations, um, let's say principles onto how these are extracted and processed. Now, of all of these supply chains, uh, all the key inputs, there's nothing. Well, especially lithium, a lot of it's coming from brine, which is very low impact. It's, you could argue on the water resources domestically is certainly in South America is an issue uh, that's constantly trying to be solved, um, which DLE tries to solve that, that issue. But I would say it's always a bit unfair. But at the same time, you know, if you're building anything now, uh, any new supply chains in the 21st century, especially today going forward, then you should be aiming to build the most sustainable, the most transparent, in addition to being as low cost as possible. Now, the, this ESG movement, you will see price premiums in contracts for the most sustainably extracted raw materials. Uh, I don't think you'll see it now, but I certainly think you'll see it three, four years onwards, where companies that can sustainably extract and produce these materials, but it might, be, it might cost you more, companies are gonna be willing to pay for that. But I guarantee those car companies will need a base, they'll need a base load of raw materials that are the lowest cost in the world first, and the ESG thing will go on top. So it's just beginning, and we'll see how the, uh, we'll see how the cards fall, but it is crucial and it is important. So uh, yeah, it is also something we're doing at Benchmark, so collecting data on the ESG of the supply chain, starting with lithium. Final question. Uh, the um, probably most coveted of many coveted market segments for this seminar are the students, particularly those registered. What advice would you give them if they want to kind of be like you or get in on the action you're describing here from any angle? Are there any particular skills, uh, skill sets, um, uh, perspectives, career paths that you would recommend at this point? I know you're kind of a, a tremendous 
almost self-made at times success story. But if you had to do it all over again, would you have uh, gotten more training in this area or more experience in that area? It's a, it's a really good question. Uh, the way I view it, the biggest problem in our industry is bridging the gap between science and research and commercialization. I find a lot of times people, and this is the industry, not just academia, they like to focus and indulge in the research and the science of it. Now, you have to have a base, fundamental base of understanding of where the cathode is going, where the anodes are going, the implications of cost and so on and so forth. But for every question and every job you apply for, any, anywhere in the supply chain, you have to ask yourself, link the research to the commercial reality. So for example, if we make a cathode like this, or we research adding this into the cathode, what is the impl impl implication on cost? More importantly, can you get that element freely enough from the supply chain? So it's the bridge between science and commercialization. If you can sit in that zone, then you will make a lot of money. It doesn't matter if you're in a battery company, if you're a car company, if you're a chemicals company, or even mining. People, um, all these companies, ex new and ex uh, existing, will need brains and people that can translate the, the science into a commercial reality. If you can do that, then you are on a, a good thing. And that's probably the best thing I can, I can say, I think. Great. Well, thanks. That's a terrific, uh, inspiring kind of an answer. I, I've noticed the business schools now. You're kind of a folk hero, as I already mentioned, in Stanford Business School. I've seen a tremendous transition in sustainability in general uh, there and the interest in it with people with technical backgrounds who get the MBA, maybe one, one of many uh, pathways uh, to, to, to get there, including Vivas, of course. Uh, we can't forget about him. So uh, with that said, I'd like to thank you for, uh, as expected, a just fabulous uh, seminar that will probably also wow the audience at uh, 4 p.m. local uh, after midnight your time. So we very much appreciate your willingness to do this remotely. I think it's been a very, from my point of view, totally biased, a tremendous example of what we might be able to do uh, asynchronously as long as we're stuck in this COVID thing, we do hope you'll come visit us here at Stanford uh, and we can set up some meetings and pay for travel and whatnot after it's safe to travel. So thank you once again uh, for a great and very inspiring seminar, Simon. Excellent, thank you, John and Sarah. I appreciate your inviting me um, on this. I, I'd like to meeting. add my thanks to Sarah who hung in there to make it all happen. So once again, uh, Sarah comes through. So thank you one and all, particularly Simon and Sarah.